There is one question that has gripped the Middle East and much of the wider world in the hours since Iran launched missiles and drones at Israel this weekend. What will Israel do next? Officially, we're told only that Tehran's attacks, which were largely foiled, will be met with a response. But tonight, leaks from Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet give a suggestion of what may be planned. It's understood Israeli ministers have agreed to clearly and forcefully strike back, but the IDF will seek to avoid inflicting further casualties. Mr Netanyahu himself is said to want to respond wisely and not from the gut. Early yesterday, we watched as history unfolded overhead. This was an unprecedented attack being stymied by an unprecedented shield wielded by a coalition that included Arab countries defending Israel for the first time ever. The massive Iranian barrage broke a taboo, but not much else. Of the more than 300 drones and missiles sent this way, just a handful evaded interception, some landing in this southern air base. The damage done by the aerial assault may be minimal, but that doesn't mean this swarm attack was anything other than seismic. On the operational level, on the strategic level, on any level, it's first time event. Seema Shine was a divisional chief in the Mossad and is an Iran expert. The question is how you retaliate, and uh, I think we'll, it will be smart to do it in a sophisticated way, not just by drones and the, and the aircraft. If you were still in the Mossad, what would you advise the government to do? To use the Mossad. <laughs> I mean, famously, Israel assassinated the head of the nuclear program. That's what uh, foreign reports are saying, and uh, yeah. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah. It's two weeks ago today that the Israeli Air Force attacked that Iranian diplomatic compound in Damascus. Israeli intelligence mistakenly believed that Iran's response to the killing of senior Republican Guard officers would come from a proxy like Hezbollah. The Israelis would not have done it had they known it would lead to Iran's first ever direct strike on Israel. The fact a regional war is not raging already is down to the brilliance of the defense mounted by the IDF and the air forces of allies, including the United States, France, Jordan, and the United Kingdom, all of whom are now urging restraint. So we are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail, and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. Iran launched an unprecedented aerial attack against Israel, and we mounted an unprecedented military effort to defend Israel. Together with our partners, we defeated that attack. Israel's coalition partners, led by Mr. Biden, are now asking this country to accept the victory achieved in the nocturnal skies of early yesterday and move on. But the war cabinet is yet to decide. It appears they have two choices, take the win or take the shot. John Irvine, News at 10, Tel Aviv. Well, more than six months in now to the war in Gaza, the fears of a wider regional conflict have rarely been so acute. So how did we get here and what potentially happens next? Raggy's here to take us through it. Raggy. Well, this decisive moment was begun by an attack that pushed this conflict closer to becoming a wider regional war across the Middle East. The first time Iran has ever launched a full-scale military assault from its soil on Israel, despite decades of intense hostility. And it was sparked by that airstrike carried out by Israel in Syria's capital, Damascus. As you heard earlier, several top Iranian Revolutionary Guard were killed. They were responsible for coordinating Iran's proxies, not just in Syria, but also in Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, and, of course, Hamas in Gaza, all against Israel. A response to the incident in Damascus had been feared, and on Saturday, of course, it arrived. Iran launched a coordinated attack with help from its proxies in the region. 
First went drones, then slower cruise missiles, and then finally faster ballistic missiles. But it was by its very nature a nuanced attack, and that's because Iran's drones took several hours to enter Israeli airspace, therefore allowing the IDF and its allies time to prepare a defense by the time the cruise and ballistic missiles were launched. 99% of the projectiles that were fired, according to the IDF, were hit. A joint effort between the US, the UK, and importantly, Jordan, home to a significant Palestinian population. Now, Israel will be compelled to respond some way, somehow. The question is, when and how? I do not think that it's likely that Israel will uh, limit itself to, again, only corresponding with Iranian proxies. We've been doing that for many years. That hasn't been successful. Now is really the time to make Iran understand that their aggressive behavior will not go unchecked and that they are not going to pay the consequences for it. Jonathan Conrike was speaking to me earlier, and despite the apparent failure of the attack, it will have allowed Iran to learn a great deal, not only about Israel's own air defense capability, but also the willingness of its allies and other countries to step in. But tonight, Julie, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has asked the IDF to come up with a range of options of how to respond to Iran, not just by direct military action. OK, Raghi, I know we'll talk to John Irvine about that shortly. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the moment on that. Well, in Israel today, unlike in Gaza, little sign of the immediate danger that this way weekend haunted the skies. This morning, restrictions imposed in response to Iran's threats were lifted and schools reopened. But across the country, divisions are emerging, specifically over if, how and when a retaliation should be brought. Defending the existence of this state is an everyday mindset on the streets of Jerusalem, passed through generations. Today, where some celebrated Israel's success in neutralizing Iran's assault on its territory. The army of Israel is the best in the world. We are the best in the world. Others recalled their fear. You can mark it. This is Carrie Freed's bomb shelter where she spent the night on Saturday with her children cowering from attack. Her husband watched the missiles be intercepted from their balcony. They're prepared for Israeli retribution. We should retaliate, but maybe later, because we're just so tired. It's 200 days of war, walking around with this feeling like something terrible is about to happen, and it's exhausting. The Israeli way of life is intact, though. Normality seems to have resumed, but they're waiting for where and how bold a move their government makes next. Israel must attack Iran. You cannot have threat hanging on the air over your head. Semha Rothman is a lawyer and a right-wing activist. So you don't fear a full-scale regional war? Wake up and smell the missiles. The attacks on Israel from Gaza, the attacks on Israel from Lebanon, the attacks from Yemen. We are in a regional war. Israel is in a regional war. A war where suffering knows no bounds. The weekend's focus may have shifted away from Gaza, but the bullets didn't. Children, families shot at as they dared to travel north. And it is in Gaza that 39-year-old Carmel Gat is still being held hostage, kidnapped by Hamas on October the 7th. Carmel speaks Arabic. She's a peaceful person. Shai Dickman is her cousin, worried now that the 133 hostages will be forgotten if tensions with Iran escalate further. I'm glad that my government succeeded to defend us from the attack. My cousin was kidnapped from her parents' house, as long as the same terror organization rules and as long as the facilitations of terror still exist, then I don't, don't know, I don't know how I can trust my own security. The skies over Israel remain quiet tonight, but this environment is fragile. Lucy Watson, News at 10, Jerusalem.